Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming to our uh, last guest lecture of the year. Congratulations on doing it during review week when we all have you know, 15 things we could be doing and you chose this, so good choice. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have made three or more of the lecture series this year? Four or more. You may have to stop and count, <laughs> give or take. So that seems to be a break point. So we had about eight or nine, um, but I was just curious. I know it's a, a major effort, but um, we had, we, it's been a great series. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, we'll try and match it next year. If you did miss any of those, and really, they were outstanding this year. Um, we, the YouTube channel is, is up and running, and you'll be able to, to uh, take a look. And I'd encourage you to do that, just to do a scan uh, to see some of the people that we've had and take a look at what they've had to say. Uh, we are giving uh, copies of uh, Clover Lee's book away at the end, so please stay for that. There will be a, uh, a suspense-filled drawing. And, uh, and now here to introduce our speaker is Janice Shimizu from the Department of Architecture. Um, oh, thank you for coming to Clover Lee's lecture entitled Objects in the Mirror Are Closer Than They Appear. And so it's been wonderful to watch Clover's trajectory um, from her first studios at USC to teaching at UCLA, Rice University, University of Michigan, and Chinese University of Hong Kong. From her earliest construction drawings at Hodges and Fung, to starting Plus Clover in 2001, returning to Hong Kong, to now completing over 128 projects, building seven, uh, 78, with 78 of them built. And just that quantitative list alone is impressive, right? But along the way, she has made such an impact, mentoring incredible architects, teaching other incredible teachers, and not just getting projects built, which is hard enough already, but digging into a critical practice and material research through diverse and aesthetic explorations. Her speculations are tested through and because of buildings. Hashtag I love construction sites. Clover's book, Amass, not only documents, documents this, but mines the work for larger lessons of the ability of architecture to generate perceivable experiences and consequences in what Clover calls the dance between invention and discovery. And with that, I'd like to welcome Clover Lee to Fall State. Janice, thanks for the introduction. Um, and thanks for having me here. Um, the title of that, this lecture, Objects in Mirror Are Closer Than They Appear, um, I'm sure all of you who drive have seen this on your side mirrors. Um, what you might not know is there's nowhere else in the world where people have this message on their side mirrors. And I'm sure everybody's side mirrors are the same. It's not like in the US they made them in a different way that objects actually are, appear closer than, are, are closer than they appear. I um, always found this message um, funny because if you're reading the message, that means you're not focusing on what you should be focusing on because it's not possible to look at the image and read the text um, at the same time. Uh, what, what this, how this speaks to me as a message is sometimes I think about the architecture discipline because there's so many opportunities within the discipline. Our discipline is not found on a fundamental truth, um, but very often is defined by the disciplines that are surrounding it to, to really kind of define the boundaries of architecture. Like, for example, Peter Eisenman is into linguistics or people into mathematics or music as sources of inspiration that helps to define architecture. As a result, I think there, there are so many um, different uh, interests that we can take within the discipline, different focuses, and also different ways of, let's say, practicing whether within academia or a professional practice. So as a result, it, it asks, like, what, what exactly are, are we focusing on? And how do we find that focus? The truth for me um, is it actually takes a long time, and I think I'm still doing it, 
Um, I, this afternoon, I had the privilege to speak to Janice's studio. We were just talking about um, modes of practice um, and just talking about work and our experiences in work. And I think a lot of times students have asked me, you know, how did you get where you are now? Assuming that everything is carefully mapped out and planned out, when in fact a lot of the things are actually very serendipitous. It's uh, very much due to circumstances that are around me. Um, they are not carefully planned out or mapped out, and things come in and out of focus all the time. Um, and so what I want to talk about today is um, how through my career and through my work and continuously trying to do that is to find that focus. Um, and a lot of it has to do with um, conversations with people around us. Um, Neil Denari is, is a friend from Los Angeles and um, he gave a talk at SciArc in 2019. I think it's for a thesis or pre-thesis course there. Um, where he talks about the, the kind of affinities that we built um, as architects. And he had a not, lot of different um, examples, like bands are different from tribes, are different from cults. And he parses out, like even, if you guys know Neil, you won't be surprised, like he's really into talking about bands, like how Beatles is one type of band versus Rolling Stones, like, you know, so he really parses out what does it mean to be part of a group. Now, um, where I was educated, I was telling uh, Janice's group today, I went to school at Cornell. I did, my, I did my Bachelor of Architecture there. And when I was there, the kind of groups that people formed, the, the, um, the whites, um, the five architects, is one group that was very dominant at that time. Um, so they had to do with a kind of shared language, you know, the kind of um, the abstraction of architecture into a model, that's called the white architects the whites, um, Richard Meyer being one of them. And that was really kind of dominating the conversation when I was at Cornell. After Cornell, I went to Los Angeles. That's where I met uh, Janice and Josh. And there was another type of grouping there. Um, it is much more loose in terms of collaboration or um, I wouldn't even call it collaboration. It's probably more like a collective or loose conversation between um, these groups of architects. And at that time, I really felt that it was, a, it was a time and place of experimentation in Los Angeles with this group of architects who, unfortunately, in this photograph is all men, when actually a lot of them did have um, female partners. Um, like, this is Craig Hodgetts. His partner is Ming Feng, Robert Mangurian with Marianne Ray. And most of these people, this is um, Tom Main with the back uh, to us, and Eric Moss, uh, Frank Gehry, Frank Israel, and I think this is Coy Howard, right? Um, almost all of them, with the exception of Frank Gehry, had one foot in academia and one foot in practice. Um, but one thing I, I really appreciated is that they definitely had a commitment towards building and the building practice. And it really influenced the kind of time that I was in Los Angeles. And it goes back to um, Neil's slide about um, you are always somewhere with someone. Because um, I think that there are often times that you think that you're working alone when in fact that you know, there are these kind of cross-pollination of ideas, um, shared goals, and you have to make an effort to find that someone um, to have that conversation with. And it's important to have those conversations to build that community and to build that tribe. Um, out of the type of groupings that Neil talked about, I, I felt the most affinity with the tribal analogy, where um, there is a kind of common interest, but everybody have their also their own um, responsibility um, and place within that tribe. Um, Janice mentioned uh, this count of projects that I've done. I'm sorry, it's a very Chinese thing to be like, I have done so many, and it's a kind of bean counter thing. But um, the purpose is not to show off how many projects I've done or I've built. Um, I think what I wanted to say has to do with my commitment to building. And the, and the thing I talked about in terms of 
um, my focus in terms of shifting in and out, like one persistent thing that has um, you know, been a consistent strain through my work is a commitment to building and interest in, in building. Um, so while you know, I've always had uh, kind of one foot in academia and one foot in practice, um, I, I find that those two forums provide different models of collaboration. And I find the dissonance between these collaborative models actually quite productive. And there are different opportunities to look at the work and to examine the work um, for me. So um, one of the disadvantages of a kind of commitment to building practice that I found is that um, things happen very, very slowly. Um, and already in Hong Kong, uh, building happens much, much, much quicker than the US. So, but it still takes a, a while. And this gives you a, just an example of how long it has taken some projects from being um, appointed, getting the project, to completing the project. So um, for those of you who are not lucky enough to get, to get this book, I did give a copy of the book to the library. So um, if you're interested, please go take a look. Um, I selected four projects to talk about tonight. Um, only one of them is in the book. The other three um, have been finished since the book uh, came out. Um, and the projects, the four projects that I've chosen, um, I would like to like talk about how these different ideas kind of run through the work. Um, it's, it doesn't have a one-to-one -one relationship between these ideas and the projects, but the fact that um, I'm interested in architecture as an intellectual project, um, as an aesthetic project, as a history project, and as a future project, or I call future practice also. So I will get into these ideas kind of through the projects themselves. So the first project is um, a residential building. It's an existing building. Um, it's called Ruby Court. Um, it used to have these uh, kind of red tiles cladding the entire building. It was built in the late uh, 1980s. And because of shoddy construction, big chunks of the tiles were falling down with the screeding. So they were in desperate need to reclad the building. So the charge was to reclad it. Um, but what was unusual about the building is that, I mean, when, when you talk about housing projects in Hong Kong, this is probably what you, you think about, like this highly repetitive um, facades with windows that have kind of no breaks. That's this continuous wall. Whereas this project um, is situated kind of within the woods. There's a lot of space around it. And what I found very unusual is that it's got two blank walls facing this incredible view of water. So those two are the um, elevator shafts. Uh, also, what is, what is unusual about it is um, the, the image that I've shown just now with like tons of windows is in a dense urban environment, you actually seldom get to look up or have a full frontal view of an elevation because you're constantly like ha looking much more oblique up at it. So it's much more per perspectival and you don't get to see the building as an object, which was something we were talking about in Zero G today, the site in Cincinnati, where it's unusual that you can actually get um, views kind of from all directions of, of the project site. So this project, you also get a chance to get a far away view. So the idea was to kind of take advantage of both the, the blank walls and also the possibility of stepping back to look at the building, that you can get the full, um, uh, full view of the height of the building um, as the kind of uh, design charge and to think about the, the possibilities of this color gradient. Um, when working on this project, I mean, one of the things I, we, we think about is, um, you know, with design is, I don't know if you guys heard of this Goldilocks theorem. You know, Goldilocks, the story of the three bears, and Goldilocks goes to eat the porridge. Papa bear's porridge is too hot, mama bear's porridge is too cold, and the baby bear's porridge is just right. That there is this thing called just right, you know, within, within design. 
um, and finding that just right. Now, I find the Goldilocks theorem actually kind of flawed because Goldilocks is kind of like a Karen, assume her preference is the just right, when obviously for Papa Bear, he likes his porridge more hot and Mama Bear likes her porridge more cold. So the just right is actually different for everybody. And in a similar way, I think with, with practice, what I have learned is um, what is just right for my client might not be just right for me. And the, the narrative of the project is actually very layered. There's a multiplicity to it. And I, what I find interesting is when I, the work can, can um, deal with these different narratives, can offer a just right for different people, the different parties that are involved, including myself. And um, one of the challenges of, I think, um, professional practice is, um, you know, having a kind of intellectual discussion about the work, you have to find the form and the right people to have that conversation and to have that dialogue. Um, if you get a chance to read the book, one thing I really appreciated was a colleague of mine from Rice, Albert Pope, who wrote the introduction, who actually helped me to see my own work in a different way, which I find incredibly valuable. And, and that's also why I'm committed to building as a project, is very often when the built work um, is completed, there are always surprises, good and bad, but I think mostly good. There are always like, things that are unplanned and unmapped. Um, the, the project provided um, different challenges. One of the things you, a lot of you know is Hong Kong is very um, pressed for space. Um, so a lot of projects, we actually work with a kind of poche space that is um, taking up a lot of a very little space, but trying to get a maximum effect. So it's kind of building thickness, not only working with the color gradient of those opaque walls, but teasing out thickness in them in order to create more kind of three-dimensional effects. And one of the kind of painful lessons um, that I've learned in Hong Kong, painful in the beginning, but it got better towards the end, is um, very often uh, the, the technology, there's a mismatch between the technology that's being used to design the project with the technology that's being used to construct the project. And if there is lack of awareness of it, um, you basically, it, it starts to fall apart. Um, for example, I mean, this is, it's done in a very low tech way. There's scaffolding put up and there are these workers behind the scaffolding putting the tiles up. Um, the color gradient is made up of 13 different colors, but 65 different mixes in order to get it to be a slow fade from one color to another. And we had to work with the tile supplier to make sure the tiles are packed um, correctly so that, and the contractor's distributing it correctly because our, my greatest fear was always, you know, every worker only working on his bid, having no idea if it's the same, if it's the right one until the day the scaffolding comes down and we would have a, you know, a wrong color spot in the middle. But in a way, those conversations actually took up a lot of our time. Um, but being part of the conversation, I think was important to understand, you know, that the execution of it and the organization of the labor is equally important as you know when we are working with you know working in the computer and the digital model and working with kind of much more um, removed parts of the project. Um, another part of the project where the technology, the, the kind of mismatch of the technology, um, became something that was uh, challenging is this nose. Um, I mentioned the poche space, like this wall, how it kind of peels off at the bottom and becomes a canopy um, that marks the entry to the towers. So, I mean, you can see how the number of tiles where it's flat is not going to match the number of tiles here. So somewhere we have to grow the number of tiles and this obsession brought us to make a BIM model, mapping out every single tile to figure out, you know, how do we, how do we splice the tiles in, um, we modeled the steel structure. And then a lot of times these bits and pieces of the building is built in China 
and then it's shipped to Hong Kong and then installed. So this kind of, we call it the nostril. The nostril was built in China. And you see here, when I went there, I realized there was no model. I mean, there was no computer <laughs> in sight in the factory at all. They never looked at up in model. These guys were wearing flip flops and climbing up this piece and just would step back and look at it and say, mm, what do you think? And so I was, I was appalled when I found out they really never looked at a model and they were just kind of eyeballing this thing out. Um, so what ended up happening was I, I went up to China multiple times, you know, trying to, you know, trying to see how it will fit, like doing dimensions, but the, the BIM model went out, went out the window very quickly. I realized the only people who looked at the BIM model was, was us. Um, but in the end, I mean, I think the, the end result we were, we were happy with, um, and it was a big learning curve in terms of you know, understanding the, the kind of technology of construction in relationship to the technology that's used for design and how our design should um, anticipate that. Um, I think that has been like one of the valuable lessons um, building in Asia where um, precision is usually not the priority. Um, but I think within those constraints, it was important for us to, to anticipate, you know, the, and, and give um, a certain, um, how do you say it, a leeway in terms of the design, how it can accommodate like inaccuracies or sloppiness into the design. Um, so part of the conversation with, with, um, with Albert about the work has a lot to do with ideas of ornamentation and how the kind of two-dimensional ornamentation is um, mapped onto three-dimensional form and the dissonance between these two that it's not necessarily about um, resolution, but it's kind of suggestive and there's slippages between the kind of two-dimensional graphics of the color gradient with the three-dimensional form. I mean, this, this project took the, the longest um, of any project I've worked on in terms of seven years. But um, it, it's been, it was very rewarding just being involved in the process and um, kind of working with the contractor and um, having dialogues with them in terms of having them understand the importance of, of the smoothness of the gradient or the smoothness of the form and how those two things kind of come together because I think one of the things is um, Asia still being quite uh, like a sexist society. It, they, they do have problems, I think, a lot of times like listening to women or having women architects talk to them. And it definitely took me a while to find a voice and figure out a way to work with them. Um, but once you've gained their trust, um, they're always very willing to go the extra mile, and they're always willing to experiment and do something different, which was quite different from the experience I had um, in Wyoming. Uh, I just completed a project in Wyoming last year uh, that I've been working on for five years. Um, this was a video that was taken, I think, about uh, just last fall. Um, the client is, is from Hong Kong. He went to Wyoming to see the full eclipse that went through the US in 2017. And, you know, coming from Hong Kong, realizing that what he would normally pay for a square foot in Hong Kong, you can buy an acre. He went nuts and bought like 15 acres of land. Um, this project is situated in Alpine, Wyoming, which is about an hour south of Jackson Hole. And, um, you know, before I moved back to Hong Kong, I lived in the States for 20 years, but never been to Wyoming. Um, and when I first got there, I was shocked by how the landscape still looks like an Ansel Adams photograph. Um, it's, it's very beautiful, it's very stunning. And um, this project I, I did in collaboration with Victor Jones. Um, he's an architect, teaches at Cal Poly Pomona, um, Victor, Janice, and I all taught at USC um, a long time ago. And um, Victor is the interior designer of the project, um, whereas I'm the architect. But I would say that um, uh, 
we really kind of worked together uh, from the beginning to the end of the project. Um, that that division of interior and exterior or interior and architecture was not so clearly defined and the two really kind of went hand in hand. Um, and we discussed aesthetics a lot. Um, we don't see aesthetics as being anti-intellectual. We think it's a fundamental part of the discipline and I think that um, that was something that we, you know, we both kind of think that it's important to be part of the conversation within architecture. Um, the project is, uh, the project brief basically included two buildings. Um, one is a hangar, um, which also includes um, uh, seven bedrooms, apartment in it, and then um, also a main house. Um, what has been interesting is you know, having lived in LA and Houston um, and only spend kind of very little time on the East Coast, I was stunned by just the kind of what happens to the landscape at the different times of the year and how different it can be. Um, so in the summer, for about four months of the year, it's totally covered in grass, it's green, it's lush. And then the rest of the time, most of the time, it's totally covered in snow. Um, and, and how we kind of navigate through this kind of high contrast of the landscape in relationship to the project. So this is the, this is the hangar. It's a, it spans 130 feet. Um, it, uh, it has a three-story apartment inside. Um, I, I think it's like a loaf of bread um, where the main chunk of the loaf of bread is where the plane is and there's one slice of the bread that's a three-story um, apartment building. Um, and what we wanted to do is not to treat the part of the hangar as a garage, as a back of house space, but that it is really kind of one entity, that there's no separation between where the, where the plane is and where the people are, that it's really one space, so that there are kind of these large openings that allow um, the kind of visual connection into the hangar space from the residential part of the project. And um, this is the, this is the, we call it the main house. And the, the way we thought about the main house is really through a series of rooms. Um, and this is really working with Victor in terms of like how each room, where we want the views from the rooms into the landscape, what it's oriented towards, and how it's organized. This is a project by um, Joop van Lieshout, um, where these different shaped rooms are kind of um, attached to one another, creating this kind of amorphous form. And in a way, we also mapped out these different bedroom suites and how it aggregates around a double height living space and then how the roofscape um, works with the surrounding mountain landscape. So you will see in some of the pictures there's a, there's a big difference between when there's no roof on the snow and when there's roof on the snow and how it reads um, in terms of the, the massing of the building. Um, the other thing about kind of working with this idea of starting with the rooms and working out a lot has to do with the views and the kind of juxtaposition of the views um, between the interior and the exterior. So um, this, is a, this is a photograph by Lee Freelander. Um, he has a, a lot of series that is uh, the, the side view mirror or the rear mirror juxtaposed with um, the view beyond. So in a way, it goes back to that the object being closer than they are. Um, but in this case, what we were looking at with the projects is how we're framing these views um, with a very, very high contrast uh, situation where because of the snow, it's almost blindingly bright on the outside. Now, you guys living in Indiana probably are like, we know that, <laughs> but I was, I was surprised how being inside, I was constantly squinting when I was looking outside because of how bright it was. And the material palette that the client preferred is kind of like this dark gray. So what happens is that we have these very, very dark kind of frames framing the views um, and also reflective surfaces that kind of extends the view beyond the window frame onto these um, surfaces in the bathroom and also a kind of um, 
a thick poche. Um, we purposefully pushed the windows to the exterior so that from the interior you kind of read the, the thickness of the construction. Here are some better photographs of this high contrast situation I was talking about where like everything on the inside becomes silhouetted um, and you get this kind of very bright view from the outside. And going back to the windows, I mean, you'll see in these photographs, the windows from the interior is very deliberate in terms of how it frames views, how maybe it delays the views upon entry. A lot of times when uh, we design it, so when you first enter the space, you actually don't reveal, reveal the view until you move through it or get to another level before you get the views of the mountains. Um, we also think about them from the outside. We really push the windows to the outside as much as possible so that during the day you see how the mountains are basically mapped back onto the building. And in a similar way, we have this very dark cladding on the outside to get this kind of high contrast reading between the views, the kind of snow-capped mountains um, with the cladding itself. That's me standing there, squinting. We actually, um, uh, Victor and I, when, when working on this project, we talked about this kind of, um, the interiority of the spaces. I mean, being in, again, like being in a very cold environment, this is kind of like a retreat, like how we treating the interior finishes, not just in terms of, um, I think the aesthetics, it's not just reduced to how it looks, but also acoustically, um, there's a kind of, we talked about the softness of sound because the snow tends to muffle the sound on the outside. And what that means when you come into the inside that we didn't want it to be acoustically very harsh, you know, that you have a lot of this echo. So, um, you know, Victor did a lot of work in terms of like thinking about acoustically how we can work with the space and use finishes that will create, that make that transition um, better between the exterior and the interior. And this is also like a shot of, you can see how the windows um, from the apartment looking back into the hangar space and how we really treated the hangar space, not as a, as a back of house space, but really part of, of the living space. Um, so that the circulation always goes through the hangar. We don't treat it as a, as a back of house element, but it's integrated into the project. It sounds like I travel all over the place. I actually don't, but um, last year I was in Stockholm and I was um, lucky to see this exhibit of Sigrid Leverance. I actually didn't know there was this exhibit. I kind of fell upon it, but um, I was uh, really pleasantly surprised because um, he's one of my favorite architects. And the show is called Architect of Death and Life. Um, Raina Bannum wrote about Leverance in the book, The New Brutalism. And he says, and he said, Leverance is very hard to categorize, that he does not belong to any one category. He's more brutal than Corbusier, but also more medieval. He's also not as austere as Asplund. And I find that, um, I find that description very interesting about that it's hard to pin down Leverance that he doesn't fall into any singular category. Um, not only do I like his work, but I think this, I see an affinity where it's not about a kind of singular project um, or having the work doesn't necessarily like galvanize towards kind of one design language. I think, um, you know, I find interest within each project in terms of its context, uh, within their own kind of particular histories of the project. So um, the, the next project that I wanted to show you is also an existing project in Hong Kong that I worked on, um, but its history is quite interesting. I mean, the history of, of Leverance, I mean, that I referenced Leverance is not that there's a direct connection of Leverance to this project per se. I think the interest in, in um, any architect's work uh, 
dead or alive, I think it's just part of my interest in architecture. But each project itself also, I think, comes with a lot of histories. And um, this one in particular is, um, is in Hong Kong. It's a six unit apartment, and it was designed by this guy called Jackson Wong. You see his name here. Now, Jackson Wong, he designed it, and there was a consultant called um, Gordon Brown. So Gordon Brown was this, uh, the dean of the architecture school in Hong Kong, and Jackson Wong was a student. So, you know, when I found the original drawings, my imagination is Gordon Brown was actually having a grand old time while Jackson Wong was the one who was laboring away on this project and designing this project. It was built in the 60s. Um, it was, when we, when we got the project, um, it was pretty much intact except the interior of the lobby, which they redid. Um, what we decided to do, the client wanted to do, is a gut renovation. So we stripped it down to its uh, concrete structure. Um, the intention is to think about how the landscape can be brought into the building and bring um, difference into the six units. The six units are pretty much identical in the original design, and we thought about how we can use roof gardens. We built a new carport with a swimming pool on top with the bridge that connected to the existing garden. So it used to be separate, and the roof of the carport was not accessible. Um, and also the balconies that each unit had, like how these um, landscape elements could actually transform the units themselves. The landscape, kind of interrogating landscape, also had to do with thinking about um, how to kind of rethink the base of the building and how it engages the ground. So what we did was, um, apart from just providing handicap accessibility, we thought about in terms of the material and also these kind of new landscape elements brought in, how we can kind of reground the building and resituating the building within the context. So it involves a series of retaining walls. These are um, GFRC panels that we actually used um, bamboo to to cast them, so when you look closely, you can see the striations of the bamboo that's imprinted um, on the GFRC. And I think working with existing buildings um, gives us an opportunity to really kind of think about how the new design is situated in relationship and in conversation with it. It's, an, it's a kind of fine line between um, preservation. I mean, obviously we didn't really preserve that much. You could see that we ripped most of it out, but also how the new design can really amplify qualities of the existing building. Um, so for example, with the, with the recladding, what we did was we used different colors in order to show how the facade pulls away from the corners to reveal windows, like strip windows, or how, like a drawer pulling out, it becomes a series of balconies um, on the street side of the project. We kept certain elements, um, like here, the handrail, the, the windows, we tried to, they were re in relatively good shape and we tried to maintain it. And we thought about how our intervention here instead of being layered on top of the old design, actually we slip it behind it. So that what we're trying to do is, it's almost peeling away the existing design to show the layer behind it, which we put in. And then how at the ground floor lobby, that kind of white layer of the existing really kind of pulls apart to reveal this under layer um, behind it. It was quite interesting project. It's almost archaeological. There were moments kind of we, we went to the foundation, we, we found a lot of the kind of original objects that the contractors left um, on the site, like tools, old tools they left in the basement. Um, but it was, a, it was an opportunity to really kind of get to know like what it was like to build then. Um, going back to this kind of technology is that the building technology hasn't actually advanced that much. Um, and this is a kind of panoramic photograph uh, on the roof of this project where you can actually see Ruby Court. At one point, I had a client who was living here 
and I told her I feel really sorry for her because before she goes home, she sees my project on this side, and after she goes home, she goes on the balcony and she sees that project on the other side. Um, this is the original plan. Each unit is a, a, a three bedroom apartment in this L shape. Um, this is kind of back of house. This is the front of house, and they have this really amazing continuous balcony. We reconfigured it to be a four bedroom unit, which is what it was kind of what the market was calling for. Um, but what we really kind of took inspiration from uh, is the balcony. Um, it's facing south, so there's a lot of sun coming in the afternoon, and this deep balcony really helps to mediate the light coming in and provide shading. But this little slot, this little Clara story here, I think really transforms the balcony because it brings indirect light in so that there's always kind of ambient light coming into the balcony at the top, kind of bring light in softly so that the roof of the balcony is not always in shade. And we, we thought about that when we were also working on the interiors um, to create kind of similar like a light scoops, um, how we can light the space that suggests how it can be used because these are all rental units, um, but without creating concrete subdivisions. So it's echoing you know, how light carves through the balcony and how it does something similar in the interior. Okay, so the last project that I wanted to show um, is called Ebram. It's an online arbitration platform for the Department of Justice in Hong Kong. They're trying to encourage people if you have like minor issues with, I don't know, with somebody that you want to sue them, they're trying to encourage an online arbitration process. So they don't have to do it in person, you don't have to go to court, but they needed a physical space um, for what they do. They feel that it is still important if somebody um, is new to this, that they can come to a, a space, talk to a real person, and understand how their case is being handled. Now, when we got this project, um, I started looking at the um, Geneva Accord. Um, the, it, the Geneva Accord is from the uh, Vietnam War. Um, and they basically, at that time, this was a photograph from 1954, um, where there was an agreement to, to split Vietnam into North and South Vietnam. The Vietnam War happened subsequently. And then when the war ended, um, they, it took them uh, 10 weeks to figure out the shape of the table on which they were going to sign the peace accord on. They couldn't agree on it. They basically, all they agreed on was that it shouldn't be this shape. Now, um, this side is what the North Vietnam proposed, a circle, um, where one side is the Viet Cong, North Vietnam government, the other side is South Vietnam and the US government. And the US government said no, a round table would mean all parties are equal. They said, we want a rectangular table, our side versus your side. And North Vietnam was like, no, that is too oppositional. So they went back and forth, back and forth. And finally, this was the configuration they agreed upon, which is a circle. But then the translators have these two little tables on the side so that it implies a division, but it is a circle. So it's this compromise. Now, I saw these diagrams before I saw the final photograph of the actual table, and I was shocked to see that it was actually this big, <laughs> that it was this humongous round table um, with those, you see those little two translator tables on the side. Um, this is called the Paris Accord that was signed, um, I think, in 1971. Um, but it, it made me become interested in this idea of negotiation and the relationship between form and negotiation. Um, and about this kind of a conversation, how to encourage conversation. So the brief that we were given has uh, certain parts uh, that they need, uh, like meeting rooms. Um, they have caseworker stations, IT offices, library, et cetera, et cetera. 
So we divided the space into different parts. Um, then we also put down a kind of a work zone in the center. Then we use these different forms that act as cookie cutters to further kind of divide up these different spaces. And what you see then is that these forms, that a cookie cutter forms, cuts through the tables, sometimes at the top, at the tabletop, and sometimes it cuts through at the, the, the leg. Um, we also, this project is in a historical building, so we couldn't touch anything along the periphery, and these columns all act as um, conduits to bring power down, um, and that's why the base of the tables are always strategically like right up against these columns, so in order to bring power into the different uh, work areas. So here's a kind of diagrammatic plan where you see the different parts of the program, and these forms, how they cut through these tables. Or for example, in this case, uh, the entry, it's about a kind of flooring difference. Um, here, this form kind of defines the edge of the conference table and the edge of the caseworker tables. And this one is actually defining the base of this caseworker table and the base of this kind of IT table. And then this one is sandwiched between the edge of this table and this kind of logo wall. We also used um, uh, a series of um, uh, kind of drop ceiling elements in order to control the acoustical quality of the space. Um, again, we couldn't touch the ceiling either, so everything has to be floating within the space. And we start to see that the whole project is like a massive piece of furniture, um, like a massive table and kind of this a massive drop ceiling. But everything is kind of studied as a, as a furniture scale. So one of the challenging things with building in Hong Kong that um, I learned is everything needs to fit in an elevator. If you can't get it into an elevator, that means you can't get it up there. So um, while these tables actually are at the scale of a small room, they're all broken into pieces and had to be kind of reattached and reconsolidated, re amalgamated kind of on site. There was a lot of on site work to bring these together. So there was also kind of um, studying where the seams will be, what's the best way to hide them, where we break them. Um, also just even the grain of the wood, how the grain of the wood of the tables would either um, amplify, can amplify the reading of the continuity of these tables and how these um, cutouts are done. And there was also, a, for me, it was a, a special interest in this project because we did this project during COVID. It was completed in uh, 2020. Um, it, it made us think a lot about like their work being virtual and they're needing a physical space for it. At the same time, we were going through everybody working from home. You know, what does it mean to come back to the office to work? Um, is it important to us? What is important to, what is important within our office and our office culture? to maintain a kind of physical presence or seeing each other kind of face to face working together. Um, I did at some point ask my office if we can give up the office because real estate is so expensive in Hong Kong, rent is so expensive in Hong Kong, and they said no way, we want to come back to the office because because of real estate, a lot of them live at home and they were going absolutely nuts working with their parents kind of <laughs> breathing down their necks. So they were all very happy to come back to the office. Um, and, and one thing we have been trying to do at the office um, is also um, something that happened before COVID. Um, actually, once I had my daughter and realizing, you know, I grew up in a culture of working where uh, we were having a discussion today about this kind of cultish uh, dedication you know, working crazy hours, um, you know, 80 hour weeks, 100 hour weeks in offices. And once I had my daughter, I realized I actually can't do that. I have somebody at home that I need to take care of. Um, and I can work at home. I don't need to be at the office all the time. I can be more efficient. It's about time management. And I started to introduce that to, I realized if I can do that, everybody in the office can do that. And so we started, um, uh, you know, uh, 
a way through which everybody is kind of independent, uh, manage their own time. Um, it also has to do with, after having had my office for you know, 23 years now, 22 years, I know now what I'm terrible at. I'm terrible at managing people. So um, letting go of those things, um, finding people I can work with whom I trust um, has been like great for me that I don't have to do something that I feel that's kind of not natural to who I am. And um, that has resulted in actually, I think, a, a very interesting dynamic in the office because um, I've encouraged everybody, if they want to, to, to find work outside the office. You know, that they can, you know, whether it's an art project, somebody gone to calligraphy, somebody gone to skateboarding, um, somebody started doing set design for pop concerts in Hong Kong. Um, my only requirement is, as long as your work in the office is done, you're, have, you're welcome to go do those projects, but you have to bring back and show us what you do. Like you have to share with us the things you learn from that and that we can all benefit from the things you do outside the office. And has really added a kind of richness to the work. Um, and I think uh, more purposeful in terms of understanding their own interest in relationship to mine. And that it's, I, I think it's been very enriching for me. And in that way, it, it points to the kind of the last bullet point I mentioned about a future project and a future practice is I feel that there is an equal importance in, in investing in people that I work with um, and, and cultivating their interest and cultivating their kind of um, particular needs and encouraging them to be um, able to talk about it and share it with us. I think sharing is the, the critical part. Um, so I think it has change the culture of the office, but in many ways, um, in, in a much better way. Uh, it's, it's, I, I think it reaches a, a different kind of equilibrium. Um, so this, this kind of singular vision, going back to that it's not, the project is not based on my singular vision, um, it's very much based on conversation. And a lot of times, in fact, um, you know, I am telling them to do something and they're all looking away from me mm -hmm. as if I'm not there. It happens a lot. <laughs> but I, this is a series of photographs that, um, that are in the book also from every project um, is being part of construction and being part of the conversation. I think through the different things that have come into focus in and out of my work, um, I know I get the most joy out of building. Um, I get the most joy when I'm up there on the scaffolding or um, doing factory visits, um, working with the people that are building the project. Um, and that really what drives um, my motivation. And in terms of the projects that I look for, um, the people that I want to work with is this interest in, in, in building our projects. Um, going back to what I mentioned in terms of um, in the projects that I've built, I have always been surprised um, by something that I will find that is not anticipated. And I think it argues for um, the need to be engaged with the physical space that we're in um, and to kind of elbow our way um, into the conversation at the city scale, at the building scale, at the furniture scale. Um, and. I'm, I think I'm very lucky that uh, when you know I look at this slide saying you're always somewhere with someone. Um, for me, that someone has always been, you know, Josh and Janice has always been part of that someone. But um, I'm very glad that today that somewhere is here at Ball State and that someone is all of you. So thank you for coming.